Greetings, folks. Welcome back to the Reese's Puffs fan club. So I presume most people know that the U.S. has a presidential election this year, and it's going to be a doozy. Both of the major party frontrunners, as of January 31st, are older than any major party's nominee in the country's history. In light of this tradition we practice every leap year, let's go back throughout the history of the United States presidency, and we'll take a look at the extremities of each president. And I don't mean political extremities. That's mostly subjective depending on your political leanings. I mean age extremities the oldest, the youngest, etc. But enough rambling, let's just delve into this topic, shall we? Be sure to like the subscribe button and hit that video or whatever. Firstly, let's focus on a topic that's been a pressing issue, particularly in the 21st century, where three elections have had the candidate's age as a larger than usual issue. Who the hell is running for president? We got two guys, man. We got John McCain, John McCain, 72 years old. He was too old 10 years ago. 72. He's so old he used to own Sidney Poitier. <laughs> Who are the oldest people to have ever been elected president of the United States? Here are the top five, again, as of January. And that statement goes for all of the information in this video. Before we get into this, note that I'm taking their age on the date of their election, not their inauguration. At number five, we have William Henry Harrison elected in 1840 at age 67. Harrison had run on the Whig ticket in 1836 and 1840 and was facing incumbent president Martin Van Buren in a rematch. The economy had taken a massive hit in what became known as the Panic of 1837, and many Americans expressed outrage at the Van Buren administration for their perceived failure to mitigate the crisis. Though his age was brought up by the Democrats, Harrison won the election in a landslide. Rather famously, Harrison has the shortest tenure of any president at just 31 days. He died of pneumonia on April 4th, 1841, becoming the first of eight presidents to die in office, at which point John Tyler, his vice president, swore himself in and managed to alienate himself from both the Whig and Democratic parties. At number four is Ronald Reagan, elected in 1980, age 69. Reagan was famously an actor throughout the 1940s and 50s before gaining political prominence in 1964 with his A Time for Choosing speech in support of Barry Goldwater's ill-fated presidential campaign. He was then elected governor of California in 1966 and ran for president twice before, in 1968 and 1976. Much like Van Buren before him, incumbent President Jimmy Carter ran a re-election campaign that can best be described as an uphill battle. Reagan handily won the Republican nomination and successfully campaigned on ameliorating the Iranian refugee crisis and economic downturn, particularly gas prices, that had plagued Carter's presidency, and Reagan won the election in a landslide. He was infamously shot by John Hinckley Jr. on March 30th, 1981, but he survived the attack and had a strong term in office. Now to a more contemporary example, number three is Donald Trump, elected in 2016, age 70. Trump had previously been known as a real estate tycoon and media personality, though he did unsuccessfully run for the Reform Party's nomination in 2000. He wrote a book about it, and some of his positions are pretty shocking given his presidency. Despite being considered a long shot for the presidency, he managed to defeat several individuals for the Republican Party's nomination in 2016, and, as if you didn't know this, faced off against Democrat Hillary Clinton, who was also a rather un popular candidate. In a surprise to everyone except the Trafalgar group, Trump won the election in an upset, though he lost the popular vote. Trump is a very controversial politician, so I'm just gonna move on. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> Yep, that's right, Ronald Reagan returns for the number two spot, re-elected in 1984, age 73. Things were up for the Republican Party, and Reagan seemed on track to easily win a second term in office. Many Democrats were supportive of his candidacy, after all. Even worse, the Democratic Party found itself divided in the primary, and in the end, they nominated Walter Mondale, Carter's vice president. Though Mondale tried to win more support by choosing the first female running mate, Geraldine Ferraro, his open promise to raise taxes and decrease defense spending as Cold War tensions flared up again proved to be extremely unpopular, and Reagan won the election with the largest electoral landslide between two candidates in history. While Reagan's second term didn't go as hot as his first, he left office a popular figure ever still, and this helped his vice president, who we'll get to later, win the 1988 election. 
And finally, at the number one spot, we have Joe Biden, elected in 2020, age 77. He was Obama's vice president and had previously unsuccessfully sought the Democratic nomination in 1988 and 2008. Age would have probably been a sizable campaign issue in the election had the COVID pandemic and protests not happened. His opponent, incumbent Donald Trump, would have been older than Reagan if he were re-elected, but Biden prevailed in the race. In fact, when he was elected, Biden was the exact same age, down to the day, as President Reagan when the latter left office in 1989. The winner of this election, which will most likely be a rematch between Trump and Biden, will automatically break Biden's 2020 record and knock Harrison off the list. Now we must go towards the inverse. Who are the youngest people to have ever been elected president of the United States? Firstly, the minimum age requirement for the office is 35 years old as dictated by the Constitution. But regardless, at number five, we have Grover Cleveland, elected in 1884, aged 47. Cleveland sought to break the 24-year Republican presidential victory streak and faced off against House Speaker James Blaine. The election was a tight one and Cleveland only prevailed because of two things, both involving New York. Firstly, he was the current governor of New York, and secondly, the Democrats galvanized the Irish Catholic vote for Cleveland in New York City after Blaine's campaign made one of the worst gaffes in American political history, referring to the Democrats' voter base as rum, Romanism, and rebellion, or in the layman's terms, alcoholism, Catholicism, and Confederate recidivism. Anyways, owing to his relative youth during the election season and to a campaign point that the Republicans used incessantly, during his first term in office, Cleveland got married to Francis Folsom. Next is the most recent example of this list, Barack Obama, elected in 2008, aged 47, though four and a half months younger than Cleveland. Obama had only been elected as a senator from Illinois four years prior, though his race and campaign for change energized many youths and minorities. He challenged fellow Senator John McCain, though the Republicans were a long shot from victory in 08. The Great Recession was in full swing and George W. Bush's approval rating was lower than it had ever been. Obama handily defeated McCain, considered too old in 2008, he was 72, and became the first and currently only African American to ever be the United States President. Number three goes to an unlikely individual, Ulysses S. Grant, elected in 1868, aged 46. Grant had cemented the Republicans' chances as a presidential victory when he declared himself as such for the election. Grant had been the hero of the Civil War, first defeating the Confederates out west, before being relocated to take on General Robert E. Lee in the east. However, three years had passed since the war ended, Abraham Lincoln was dead, and President Andrew Andrew Johnson was loathed by basically everyone in the country. Grant was up against Horatio Seymour, arguably the most unwilling presidential nominee in history. His campaign certainly didn't do him any favors, and Grant had the support of former slaves and blacks nationwide that can now vote. Grant easily won the election for these reasons, though his presidency was marred with corruption and scandal, though he himself was seldom implicated. Another Democrat that surged to victory based on a campaign of change against the current economic system was Bill Clinton, elected in 1992, aged 46 three and a half months younger than Grant. Clinton had previously served as governor of Arkansas and now challenged incumbent President George H.W. Bush for the highest office in the nation. Also in the running was a notable Texas billionaire, Ross Perot, who ran as an independent in 1992 and later with his own party, the Reform Party, in 1996. Clinton effectively managed to hammer Bush with criticism over his backpedal on his promise not to raise taxes, a promise he had to break with the Omnibus Budget Act of 1990. Bush became the most recent Republican to get under 40% of the popular vote, getting 37% to Clinton's 43%. Before we get to the youngest person elected, we have two honorable mentions. The first is Theodore Roosevelt, who was the youngest person ever to be president, sworn in aged 42 in 1901. He was elected vice president in 1900, running alongside President McKinley's re-election campaign. Roosevelt was thrust into the presidency when McKinley was assassinated in September 1901. The second honorable mention was, oddly enough, McKinley's opponent in 1896 and 1900, William Jennings. Bryan. Bryan was the joint populist Democratic nominee in 1896, running at the age of just 36, the youngest person ever to be nominated for president by a major party. He lost all presidential elections he contested, the aforementioned 1896, 1900, and 1908, when he lost to William Howard Taft. 
Finally, the youngest person to ever be elected president was John F. Kennedy, elected in 1960, aged 43. Kennedy was a member of the prominent Kennedy political family and was an elder brother to Robert and Ted, who also played large roles in American politics. Kennedy, a senator from Massachusetts, ran against Republican Richard Nixon, the current vice president. The race was tight between Kennedy and Nixon, being the first ever to hold general election debates between the two. The first debate was broadcast on national television and it likely gave Kennedy an edge over Nixon. Kennedy barely defeated Nixon in the popular vote, but the electoral vote was a mess, as 15 Southern electors voted against the pro-civil rights Kennedy, instead voting for Harry Byrd of Virginia. Kennedy's presidency turned out to be one of extreme tensions with the Soviet Union, particularly during the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. Moving now from a president's election to the tail end of their tenure, let's take a look at the presidents who went on to have the longest retirement, measured from the day they left office to the day they died. This list doesn't include former presidents who are still alive. In fifth place at 21 years is Martin Van Buren, leaving office on March 4th, 1841, and dying from complications due to asthma on July 24th, 1862. Next is John Adams at 25 years, leaving office on March 4th, 1801, and dying of a heart attack on July 4th, 1826, mere hours after his vice president and successor, Thomas Jefferson. Next is another father whose son later served as president, George H.W. Bush. His retirement lasted 25 years, six months longer than Adams. He left office on January 20th, 1993, and died of complications from Parkinson's disease on November 30th, 2018. Secondly is the only president to never have been elected vice president nor president, Gerald Ford, who lived 29 years from when he left office on January 20th, 1977, to his death from diffuse arteriosclerosis and arteriosclerotic cerebrovascular disease on December 26th, 2006. The man with the longest post-presidential retirement, excluding the living Carter, is Herbert Hoover, leaving office on March 4th, 1933, and living a whopping 31 years until his death from internal bleeding. He'd remain active in politics, though after attempting for the Republican presidential nomination in 1940, he never ran for anything. There is one thing that all five of these men have in common, and that is they only served one term, or half a term in the case of Ford. By contrast, a number of presidents died not long after leaving office. In terms of the shortest retirement, the fifth shortest goes to Calvin Coolidge, who left office on March 4th, 1929, and died of coronary thrombosis on January 5th, 1933, just shy of four years and during the lame duck period of his successor, the aforementioned Herbert Hoover. Fittingly enough, the next individual died while Coolidge was in office, that being Woodrow Wilson, who left office on March 4th, 1921, and died on February 3rd, 1924, at two years and ten months. Wilson had suffered a number of strokes while in office, leaving him practically incapacitated for the last last two years of his term. His wife, instead of Vice President Thomas R. Marshall, took over the number of duties in that time. Living only a month less than Wilson is a far better president, George Washington. He left office on March 4, 1797 and died from bloodletting on December 14, 1799. Next is Chester Arthur, who left office on March 4, 1885 and lived another year, dying of a cerebral hemorrhage on November 18, 1886. Lastly, the shortest to-death retirement for an American president goes to James K. Polk, who died of cholera only three months after leaving office on March 4th, 1849. He died on June 15th at the relatively young age of 53. Alright, enough of death. Let's focus on the living for a brief moment. Who are the oldest living presidents? This is a relatively simple count. At number five is Bill Clinton, born on August 19th, 1946, who is currently 77 years and five months old. Next is his successor, George W. Bush, born on July 6th, 1946. He is currently 77 years and six months old. Then is Donald Trump, born on June 14th, 1946, 77 years and seven months. Then comes his successor, the current president, Joe Biden, born on November 20th, 1942, currently 81 years old. The oldest person to have ever served as president in the United States is Jimmy Carter, born on October 1st, 1924, and currently a whopping 99 years old. To put things into perspective, when Carter was elected president in 1976, Biden was still serving his first term as a senator, a position he held from 1973 to 2009. The final category I'll discuss in this video does have to deal with lives too short. These are the five youngest presidents at the time of their death. Once again in the list, this time at the number five spot, is Chester Arthur, aged 57 when he died of an aforementioned cerebral hemorrhage on November 18th, 1886. Next is the fame Abraham Lincoln, who was 56 years old when he was assassinated on April 15th, 1865, though technically he was shot the day before. Then comes the also aforementioned James K. Polk, whose life was ended by the ever-infamous cholera, 
aged 53 years old on June 15, 1849. Then comes James Garfield. He was shot by Charles Guiteau on July 2, 1881, just under four months into his presidency. He spent the last two months of his life dying in a bed, and an infection incurred by this doctor's lack of sanitation killed him on September 19, 1881, aged 49. The youngest president to ever die was, of course, John F. Kennedy, who was just 46 years old when he was assassinated in Dallas on November 22, 1963. The youngest president elected became the youngest president slain, and the most recent president to die in office. Except for Nixon, every president after Kennedy has to date completed their term. And with that, I think I've talked enough for today. I think most folks can agree that the last two presidents have been too old for their position, and this election only further stresses that point. The two major party candidates, because let's face it, there is no contest within the primaries, are both set to be the oldest person ever elected president if they win. The issue of political age in the United States seems to be the most pressing of an issue than ever in the country's history. And should a young candidate receive the Democratic or Republican nomination in 2028, the energy of the United States will almost certainly change directions for good or ill. And before I go, some of you may know when this video was posted. Ignoring that I wrote the bulk of the script two months ago, if you're watching this when it premieres, then let it be known that this channel is officially 10 years old. Wow. 10 years. Two years ago, I never thought I'd still be posting now, but it certainly didn't pan out like I'd expected. I'm not entirely sure how I went from posting random kid nonsense to stupid PowerPoint quote-unquote animations and redundant memes to this video, but it's certainly better than what came before it. To those who stuck around, thank you for being a part of this. Happy 10 years, folks, and as always, drink your water and stop falling over.